like to welcome the second speaker onto the stage, please. Uh, Professor Michael Hoffman needs no further introduction, I think. Uh, nuclear medicine physician, head of prostate, um, and head of PET at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre as well, talking about how I, he, select patients. Thanks, Grace. Uh, and thanks for the great talk, uh, Gabriella. You've provided a good basis for the guidelines, and this talk's going to be a little bit of how we do it at, at Peter Mac. Uh, with a bit of personal views as well. So I think there are many treatments for prostate cancer now. This is a nice uh, review article recently published that has all of them, including uh, Pluvicto in there. And clearly the guidelines at the moment state that lutetium PSMA 617 should be used in the post uh, docetaxel, post uh, androgen receptor pathway inhibitor setting. Uh, but perhaps with therapy trial before carbazitaxel and as Gabriella pointed out, we think it's quite reasonable to use prior to docetaxel in patients who are medically unsuitable for chemotherapy. But what differentiates lutetium PSMA from all these other treatment options is our ability to image it and to select patients with imaging. We can't do that for chemotherapy. We can't do that for androgen uh, receptor targeted uh, treatments. And when we image patients, we see different intensities of uptake, high intermediate or low. This is just the article in JNM where we compare to salivary glands above, uh, below, or a mixture in between. And we know that as the uptake increases, the likelihood of responding increases. Uh, so this is a very unique prognostic and predictive biomarker uh, with lutetium PSMA. We have high level evidence from two clinical trials, therapy and vision, and there was a lot of similarities between these trials, more similarities actually than differences. One of the differences was that uh, therapy trial used FDG PET-CT, whereas vision trial just used contrast-enhanced CT. This is to identify sites of PSMA-negative disease. The response rate in therapy by PSA was 20% higher, 66 compared to 46, but we excluded around 20% more patients. We actually infer from this that the patients we excluded in therapy didn't do that well. They had limited benefit from this treatment. So as you select patients better, you increase your response rates. Uh, so just to summarise, and it's the second row, so inclusion criteria for therapy, not only did we do S FDG, but we required higher intensity uptake, SUV max greater than 20, which is basically more than salivary glands. Uh, whereas vision was greater than liver, and liver has an SUV of about 5 to 7. So there's this group of patients uh, between 5 to 7 and 20 included in vision that we did not include in the therapy trial. We know that the reporter agreement for using the vision criteria in combination with contrast-enhanced CT is very good. Uh, please word your reports carefully. We don't like reports like this. Uh, this is one from the other week. Intense PSMA at all sites of bone metastatic disease. Lutetium PSMA appears a suitable treatment option. Patients now read their PET reports and they read lutetium PSMA is suitable. And it's a complex decision. You can't decide if you're suitable for lutetium just on the basis of a PET scan uh, without comparing to the contrast enhanced CT, maybe an FDG. So please avoid this. And I don't know what you mean by intense. What you say is intense could be SUV6 and to someone else it's SUV30. So really, I don't know what this means, and then I have to go re-look at the scan. So I prefer a report. This is how I would have worded the same report. Heterogeneous PSMA uptake at all sites of bone disease. It gives me an idea of what it looks like. With SUV max 14 in the sternal metastasis and many other sites similar or less than liver. And then I know it's probably in that intermediate group. And I wouldn't make any recommendation about suitability for therapy. I think that's a complex decision. So please document your SUV max and your intensity relative to liver and parotid gland. Uh, use a standardised template like PROMISE2 and compare to either contrast enhanced CT or FDG. So clinical trials are useful, uh, but we need lots of nuances where there's not enough clinical trial data to guide us. I'm part of the APCCC panel along with many other people here. I can see uh, Ken and uh, Louise Emmett and uh, Declan Murphy also part of this and we ask a panel of experts questions that aren't answered by the phase three trial and clearly there's consensus when we should use lutetium PSMA it's after an ARPI and docetaxel but in chemotherapy unfit you can still use it 
but do not use it in the hormone sensitive setting outside of clinical trials. Clear consensus, 86%. And based on PSMA PET, about a quarter recommend using the therapy threshold and two thirds recommend using the vision uh, criteria. And to identify PSMA negative sites, around half just use con recommend contrast enhanced CT and half recommend FDG. But in half, they rec quarter recommend FDG in everyone and a quarter would use it sort of selectively based on uh, after seeing the contrast enhanced CT findings. So we continue to do FDG PET in everyone, and this is why. Uh, this is a patient uh, being worked up. The PSMA PET shows multiple metastases. The SUV max is 22, so it's over 20, suitable for therapy, clearly higher than liver. And when we do the FDG PET the following day, we see a quite a different picture, uh, vastly greater volume of metastatic disease. We can colour code this, and in red, we see disease that's FDG positive, blue PSMA positive. If we combine them together, now the red is discordant disease that we cannot target with the treatment. And when we look at the CT, there's absolutely no abnormality at this site of FDG positive, PSMA negative bone metastases. So FDG PET makes some of this disease uh, visible. And it's really important. And sometimes knowing the true extent of disease just helps you make better decisions for the individual patient in front of you. It may not change with the exact treatment you do, but it will make subtle differences. This patient has a discordant lesion in the cervical spine that was not visible on CT alone. And you know you want to monitor this very carefully. Ask the patient, do you have any pain there? Think about giving external beam radiation to this site because if you miss this site of progression, the patient will present with cord compression, which is really a devastating side effect. So this treatment is not magical. It's a, essentially a radiation delivery device, a liquid form of radiation. It finds its way to the tumour. We can do fancy dosimetry. We don't have time to do this in everyone. And we can really see that when we do this, uh, the doses to normal tissues is quite homogeneous and predictable. However, the dose to tumour, unlike in external beam, is very variable. You can see a huge variation. And this is why we see a variation in treatment response. And we've looked at this, and in patients with lower doses, we see a much lower likelihood of responses. So much so that if you got less than 10 gray on average to tumour, there was a 10 to one non-responder to responder ratio. These are patients that perhaps, you know, we shouldn't be prioritising for treatment. And we've now got good data from our randomised trials that if we use quantitative PET, that it's a very powerful prognostic and predictive tool. In the therapy study, an SUV mean over 10, 91% of those patients had a 50% PSA response when they received lutetium PSMA. This data replicated in the vision trial. This is data by Philip Kuo and Ken, uh, presented at EA&M last year, not yet published, showing overall survival in the vision trial compared to the SUV mean. And you can appreciate the hazard ratios dropping, meaning more likelihood of surviving longer compared to the standard therapy in the control arm as your SUV mean increased. And you can probably appreciate that over 10, it's quite a sharp uh, improvement in survival, even though they did not identify any specific cut point that was better than any other. This was a continuum. And let's not forget about FDG PET. This is data from the therapy trial compared to overall survival, a very hard endpoint, published recently in our Lancet Oncology uh, follow-up. And you can see the purple, this is the group with the over 250 mil, the quartile of patients with the largest volume of disease do much, much worse. These differences between the red and the purple are massive. Uh, so patients with large burdens of FDG avid disease do very poorly. By two years, almost all of these patients are dead. So this is a group of patients that perhaps need to be prioritised for treatment intensification. I would encourage all institutions to have their own guidelines, whether you just follow the NCCN guidelines or adapt them themselves. Do document how you do this. Uh, we sort of document how we define medically unsuitable so that we can define this group of patients. And will AI come along and help us work out who to treat, who not to treat? Well, we used, I used AI in one of my talks at an Australian nuclear medicine meeting earlier in the year. I came up with this picture generated using uh, deep learning 
Now, this is Louise Emmett. This is how she appears when you walk into her department, and she was quite angry. She was saying, do not treat everyone. You must select patients uh, very carefully. So with that, I'd like to thank you. And uh, key takeaway messages is that the current indications is post an androgen receptor pathway inhibitor, antaxane. It's reasonable to use if you're medically unsuitable for taxane chemotherapy. Our response rates increase with PSMA intensity. I had consider FDG PET and I've changed it to use FDG PET CT, even though that's not in the guidelines and not in widespread practice. I think it's actually a cheap, cost-effective test. You know, even if a PSMA costs three or $4,000, one dose of Pluvicto is 25, 30,000 or more do dollars. So this is a cheap test to decide which patients perhaps you should not treat. And you really need to do this in very close collaboration with nuclear medicine, medical oncology, urology, and uh, radiation oncology. And uh, just highlight the next Advanced Prostate Cancer Consensus Conference coming up in a few weeks in Lugano. This is open for all attendees and we have a lot of international people here. So consider coming, it's a great meeting. Thank you.